And it's a pleasure to welcome Tapio Schneider uh, as our speaker today. Tapio is the Theodore Wu Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at Caltech and a senior research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. His work has elucidated how rainfall extremes change with climate, how changes in cloud cover can destabilize the climate system, and how winds and weather on planetary bodies such as Jupiter and Titan come about. He is currently leading the Climate Modeling Alliance, whose mission is to build the first Earth system model that automatically learns from diverse data sources to provide accurate climate predictions. He was named one of the 20 best brains under 40 by Discover Magazine, was a David and Lucille Packard Fellow and Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow. He is the recipient of the James R. Holton Award of the American Geophysical Union and the Rosenstiel Award of the University of Miami. Thanks for talking us. That, thanks for coming to talk to us today, Tapio. Really looking forward to your seminar. Yeah, thank you, Craig, and thank you for joining. Um, should say, I mean, the, the seminars. It's, it's wonderful that we can have these across continents, but interactions are always a challenge. I don't mind being interrupted. I don't mind if you have questions. You can put them in the chat. I see them uh, ahead of in front of me, so ch chime in. And of course, we have time in the end. So I want to talk about how to make climate models better and how to accelerate climate science with hybrid AI approaches. And I will talk about general principles that we employ with a few concrete examples focused on cloud modeling. And this work is based on a large team of people, the Klima team, the Climate Modeling Alliance at Caltech, at MIT, at JPL. And I'll mention some of the people along the way who have contributed. Well, the why question I think is pretty clear to everyone. Why do we need to do this kind of work? Here is the climate sensitivity. So the te temperature change, the global warming in response to doubling CO2 concentrations in equilibrium in the latest generation of CMIP-6 models. You see there's just a wide range of model responses, somewhere between two and almost six degrees warming in response to doubling CO2 concentrations. And that's just too large a range to be very useful for climate adaptation, for example. We need to plan for climate changes and would like to have more certainty about the climate we should expect. There are many sources of uncertainties contributing to the uncertainty in climate sensitivity that percolates into any impact prediction. So if you want to know how extreme rainfall in Melbourne or drought in Melbourne will change, the first thing you need to know is the change in global mean temperature that then is one determinant of all local changes. There are many sources of uncertainty. One stands out. Low clouds, especially over tropical oceans, are uncertain in that we do not know how they will respond to climate changes. The low clouds I'm talking about are, for example, the stratocumulus clouds that you see off the coast of California, Baja California here. So I'm sitting somewhere around here. I hope you can see my mouse. And just around year round, the ocean is covered by a white blanket, stratocumulus clouds. Same over just about any um, eastern portion of subtropical oceans off the west coast of Australia, same story. If you go further west from the west coast of the continent, for example, fly to the Hawaiian Islands here from California, you encounter different cloud regimes. Here you have cumulus clouds. And they're much more scattered. There's more dark ocean surface exposed between them, as a result of which the ocean underneath those clouds is a good bit warmer than underneath the stratocumulus clouds where sunlight is being reflected. There are also other factors contributing to differences in ocean temperatures, ocean currents, for example. But one large factor is, is the cloud cover. And fundamentally, we don't know if we'll get more low clouds, which would damp global warming because their primary energetic effect is to reflect sunlight, or if you get fewer low clouds, which would amplify warming um, as CO2 levels rise. The evidence in the last year or two is increasingly that we'll get fewer low clouds, thinner low clouds, so an amplification of global warming. But in the climate models, not even the sign of this effect is, is clear, much less the amplitude. So if you would want to reduce the 
spread and climate sensitivity in the CMIX-6 models to one key factor, it is that the models on the right that have a lower climate sensitivity, warm less in response to doubling CO2, tend to produce more low clouds. And the models on the left that have a high climate sensitivity tend to produce fewer low clouds, amplifying the warming. There are other cloud effects that play a role, for example, clouds over the Southern Ocean, microphysical effects, but the low clouds in the tropical, over the tropical oceans are one standard effect that accounts for around half the variance um, that you see here. So this is a problem we need to solve. So if you want more accurate climate predictions, the first thing you would want is improved models of clouds and generally other small scale processes. The, the big problem in climate modeling in general is our inability to resolve small scale processes globally. And yet these small scale processes, for example, turbulence sustaining clouds are important for the global climate. Same is true, for example, for the biosphere. There are small scale processes in plants we cannot model explicitly, yet they're important for the response of the carbon cycle, for example, to global warming. If you need to find ways of modeling these small or difficult to model processes um, so that we can understand their global scale effects, which are significant. Clouds, why are they difficult but important? There are various ways of looking at it. The simplest is perhaps just to say that the dynamical scales controlling clouds are small. So a global climate model has a horizontal resolution of typically around 100 kilometers going towards 10 to 50 kilometers. We have first models that go towards a kilometer or order one kilometer resolution that can't be run for very long, but that will be achievable as I'll argue in just a minute in, in the decade to come. However, the crux of the problem is that these low clouds, for example, on the right here of Baja California, stratocumulus clouds again, have dynamical scales in the range of meters to tens of meters. There's just no way that we can explicitly resolve this computationally anytime soon. So instead, these processes, the small scale processes are represented in fairly ad hoc ways linking what is unresolvable to what is resolved through prioritization schemes, subcut scale prioritizations. And that is not always working well. Stratocumulus clouds are a prime example here. The black lines are observational data, in this case, off the coast of Peru, South America. The top panel, you see cloud cover. Cloud cover hovers around 70% year round uh, in, in the observational data. And this is from a previous generation of climate models. It hasn't changed in the latest generation. The all models have a severe low bias in cloud cover. So up to a factor two to three in cloud fraction of a low bias, which really leads to a warm bias in temperatures because there are fewer clouds to reflect sunlight. And as a result, the surface underneath is warmer than it should be. It's not as warm as one would think it should be, I mean, it's several degrees bias that's significant over huge areas of the tropics. These clouds cover 20% of the tropics, so it's not a small thing. But the bias is somewhat mitigated by the fact that the clouds that the models do simulate tend to be too bright. I mean, they're somewhat artificially made bright to reflect more sunlight so that the energetic bias is not as big as the cloud fraction bias alone would suggest. It's a well-known issue, has been known for decades. It's so well known, it has a name. It's what's known as the too few, too bright bias of climate models. It leads, for example, to rainfall biases in the ITCZ and various other follow-on effects. You hear a lot of talk these days about high resolution models and how they will help. Now, I think it's important to be really clear about what high resolution simulations can do and what they can't do. When I started to work in this area, good eight years ago or so by now, I wanted to convince myself at first that I, as a scientist, will not become redundant too soon because clearly that wouldn't be interesting to work on it if, if one is outcomputed in no time. So with a few friends um, in Zurich and uh, the University of Washington, we compiled data. And the data we compiled is the performance of the fastest computer in the world over time. So starting from 1979, which was the time of the Charney report, and arguably the first climate assessment we had, then the ARA-1, ARA-2 and the like mark the appearance of various IPCC reports. ARA-6 is not on it because this was published in 2017. 
And the peak performance of the world's fastest computers is just plotted on the log scale, in gigaflops. And you see the uh, performance has increased exponentially. I was somewhat surprised making the plot because the exponential increase does not seem to have abated, although Moore's law in, in the, the form envisioned isn't quite valid anymore. Dinar scaling isn't quite valid anymore. But the exponential increase, doubling of computer performance every roughly 1.2 years has continued, uh, largely because of massive parallelism. So this is the computers we had, and the world's fastest computers have historically been used for climate simulations. On the same plot, here is the horizontal resolution of the atmosphere components of the world's climate models, everything published until 2017. And we started out with atmosphere only models, AGCMs and solid circles. Then we, we had atmosphere ocean coupled models and in, uh, in open circles. Now we have our system models with active carbon cycles and diamonds. And their horizontal resolution is plotted on the log axis as well and scales of inverse kilometers. And in just such a way that a factor 10 increase on the left on the resolution axis corresponds to a factor 10 to the four increase on the right performance axis. Because in order to achieve a factor 10 increase in resolution in global simulations, you need 10 to the four times as many flops. So 10 to the three for three space directions times another factor of 10 for time. So you see that to the extent there is any line going through these orange dots, it's shallower than the blue lines, which is to say the resolution of atmosphere models has not increased as much as it could have increased had we put all marginal increases in computer performance into resolution increases. And there are good reasons for that. We built atmosphere ocean models rather than just atmosphere models, Earth system models. The complexity of models has increased rather than just increasing the resolution. And a lot of interesting science has come out of that process. But suppose now, today we decide really our big problems, say our clouds and small scale processes in the atmosphere, also small scale processes in the ocean that matter, but suppose we just invest all marginal increases in computer performance and resolution in the atmosphere. And suppose, flops continue to double every 1.2 years. Not terribly realistic for those knowing about evolution of computer architecture, but let's assume it for the sake of argument. So we would follow the dashed blue lines in computer performance, doubling every 1.2 years, the number of flops. It's actually remarkable. We have to keep in mind, we already have an increase in number of flops of 10 to the eight since the, since the Charney report. So let's suppose it continues exponentially and all that, all these flops go into resolution increases. So then from here on, climate models should follow this dashed lines in the resolution. So we will reach the deep convection gray zone where we have horizontal resolutions between 10 and one kilometers within a few years. As I said, we already have models that achieve that just for short times, but we would be able to do this routinely. The big problem, however, is that these low clouds have scales of meters, tens of meters or so. And you can argue a bit about how much you need horizontal resolution versus vertical. And depending how you, how you parcel the argument, you end up with a factor of roughly 10 to the 11 that you need in flops in order to simulate these low clouds explicitly. And maybe it's 10 to the 10 or 10 to the nine or 10 to the 13. It's not terribly important for the argument here. The crux is that this is not something we'll achieve anytime soon. So if you follow the exponential doubling of, of performance, we would only resolve these low clouds explicitly in the 2060s. And you know that's clearly too late as a useful prediction of climate change. So brute force computing is not going to solve it. And I think it's important to keep in mind in all these discussions of high resolution climate modeling, it only gets us to the gray zone for deep convection. It does not get us to resolving clouds. So you still need to do something about low clouds for sure, even if the deep convection becomes explicitly resolvable. Obviously, you'd hope that in some fashion, all the data we have about the Earth system and all the wonderful tools of AI broadly understood can come to the rescue here. And I think they can. But it is important to be mindful of how one would use AI tools and data, because there are a few special challenges in climate projections that you don't have, for example, for weather forecasts. First, and very importantly, we need to predict the climate none of us have seen. We need to predict the climate that has no observed analog. So we need tools that generalize out of the observed sample. 
Deep learning methods are good interpolation tools. They are not good for generalization out of the training sample, at least not if used as black box approaches. For climate modeling, we also need interpretability of the models we have. And I think that's more than a nice to have feature, it's essential. One reason why it's essential is that we want people, the world to trust our climate predictions. And the only way to win that trust is make it entirely transparent how these models work. And if one, there is a crucial black box in the middle that is hard to interpret, it will be hard to achieve that transparency. And thirdly, I think we need uncertainty quantification in weather forecasting that has become standard to great benefit to the rest of society. The same we need for climate models. We need to estimate risks, meaning probabilities, meaning uncertainties. For climate change adaptation, we need more than just a point forecast. We want ranges, we want uh, confidence intervals and the like. So all, all three, generalizability, interpretability and uncertainty quantification are important. And all three are a challenge for machine learning methods used somewhat naively. It's useful to reflect on what has led to the success of deep learning. And in some ways, what the successes are of what you might call reductionist science. Uh, deep learning rests on over parameterization. You fit models that can be very expressive, but they are very data hungry because they're vastly over parameterized when fits a large number of parameters. That works really well in fields that are data rich, where interpolation is all we need. But it makes generalizability, interpretability, and uncertainty quantification, it makes all three challenging, extremely challenging. Reductionist science success rests on what you might call parametric sparsity. Um, we have models that are extremely generalizable and interpretable. Think of Newton's law of universal gravitation. It, it's a law that's wonderful for figuring out how an apple falls off a tree or how a planet's orbit stars. And extremely generalizable, it's a one parameter law. It's only one parameter that needs to be estimated from data in some fashion and the rest are variables entering masses of objects and the like. But this kind of reductionist approach clearly reaches its limits in complex systems such as the Earth system. It would be wonderful to have a description of clouds that as, as, as neat and simple as Newton's law of universal gravitation, but we don't have that and are not likely to easily get that. So our approach here is to combine both traditional reductionist approaches with AI approaches broadly understood where reductionism reaches its limits. Let me just show you how that works and how the, the general principles we employ and then give you some concrete examples of how we employ them. Um, our view and our here is entire Klima group and a lot of these ideas were summarized in, uh, in a popular article I wrote with Nadia Jivanji and Rob Sokolow that appeared last summer in Physics Today in June and the June issue, you can look it up there. Our view is that if you combine advances in theory, reductionist science, with harnessing data, with leveraging computing power, we can actually accelerate climate science and get much better climate models. You want to advance theory to use the known equations where you have them as far as possible. For example, with systematic coarse graining approaches. What this does is it promotes parametric sparsity of the resulting models. Of course, we want to use data, especially all the Earth's observations from space, from the ground we already have, We're getting around a terabyte per day. Those data we want to exploit. And they have not been exploited in climate modeling to the degree that many think they might have been exploited. In weather forecasting, they are used quite extensively, not so much in climate, climate uh, modeling. And we want to leverage computing power. We are transitioning to hardware with accelerators, graphics processing units, tensor processing units, and all sorts of other platforms coming along. This is often lamented in the climate world because it means we have to recode our models, but it's also an opportunity because it enables us or it allows us to use the computing power these platforms provide in new ways. For example, it allows us to carry out distributed local simulations of small scale processes. So clouds, we cannot simulate globally, but they're governed by the laws of thermodynamics, Newton's laws, <coughs> excuse me, which we know. So we can simulate them local, local simulations with meter resolutions quite well. And you can 
run these local simulations on the cloud, for example. <coughs> so our big picture view of what we do is this. At Klima, we're building a newer system model, and it looks in many ways like existing or system models as mechanistic process and form models at its core. But the models are from the outset built so that they can learn effectively from space-based data and from high resolution simulations that we can spin out of this model on the fly when we need, need to. For example, clouds, we can simulate in high resolution simulations, sea ice, ocean turbulence and the like. And we can learn from those high resolution simulations just as much as we can learn from observational data. So this is easy to say, but not actually easy to do. Let me just outline how it actually works. And let me talk about modeling clouds because it's closest to what I'm personally involved in. Although similar principles apply to modeling the biosphere, for example, and we use a very similar approach there successfully for land biosphere. <coughs> so in, in modeling clouds, we start from the equations of motion. It's Navier-Stokes equation, laws of thermodynamics. And symbolically, you can write them in this, in this form. There's a continuity equation, some conservation law. And there is an equation for any kind of scalar mean phi, which might be a thermodynamic variable or a velocity variable. And what we do is we conditionally average these equations over subdomains of the fluid. The subdomains are identified with coherent structures, plumes, updrafts, downdrafts, and a less coherent isotropically turbulent environment. Indexed by this index i might be n of these uh, coherent structures plus the more isotropically coherent isotropic environment indexed by zero. And if you coarse grain the equations conditionally average over the subdomains, this is what you get. Um, it's essentially an exact decomposition of the fluid equations. And on the left hand side, you have your somewhat usual looking conservation law just indexed by these subdomains i. And the A is the area fraction occupied by the subdomain that in itself is a variable the system would need to predict. But on the right hand side of the system, there are all sorts of closure terms arising, meaning terms that come from the fact that we are averaging, that we throw some information away. And for example, in the continuity equation, continuity equation these terms involve the mass exchange between plumes and their environment, or one plume and another called entrainment, detrainment, and then other equations, there are additional turbulent transport terms arising, sources, sinks that need to be modeled, and the like. The idea is you go back to um, pioneering work by Pierre Shivisma and his colleagues at ECMWF in the early 2000s. Uh, he developed what's called the eddy diffusion mass flux closure, and we're building on those ideas. So the key thing here is this. Everything on the left hand, left -hand side is an e essentially exact, or there's some approximations going in, but they're very controlled decomposition of the equations of motion. Everything on the right hand side, we don't really know. There is mass exchange terms that in some fashion we need to relate to what we resolve, what's on the left hand side here, turbulent transport terms, same way. So these functions, I think, are great targets for machine learning approaches. Uh, they, they can be stochastic functions, they can include structural error models and the like, but the essential point is that we move the use of AI tools to the level where reductionism doesn't get us any further. We don't know how to close those. We have some ideas about limiting cases of these functions, but we don't know exactly what this functional form is. We don't even know if they're functions. They might be functionals. Um, it's in some ways what has happened in fluid dynamics for more than 100 years since Prandtl times. You use similarity arguments, say, in a boundary layer that gets you to some point where there are some unclosed functions appearing in, in the boundary layer equations. And those functions you learn from data, you infer from measurements. So one in Ovikov similarity theory, for example, would do, would do that. And we're using the same approach. You just reduce the problem to some non-dimensional functions you can learn from data, and you can use various types of machine learning tools to do so. Let me just show you an example of how well that works. And I think it's mostly an example about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. So here is just a map. It's solely to orient yourself. It's from an existing climate model. What it's showing is the cloud cover bias. Um, it's the, the bias in low, cloud, in low clouds 
So red means there is a low bias. So model simulates fewer clouds than is observed. And it's in percent. So the color scale saturates somewhere around 40 or 50 percent here. So off the coasts or off the eastern portions of subtropical ocean basins, you have huge areas with these stratocumulus clouds where you have a bias of 40, 50, and more percent in cloud cover. And this is just from one model. I only show the plot because they made a nice plot to illustrate the point. Basically, all climate models you look essentially the same. And what we did is we generated data computationally right now. Um, the way we generated the data is by embedding large eddy simulations in existing climate models, in a few existing climate models. So some examples, for example, the Hartley Center model here. And there are a few distinct sites called CF sites for a, there, where sufficient model output is available to look at cloud feedbacks in quite some detail. And we simulated conditions at many of these sites in different climate states with large eddy simulations, thereby generating what by now is a training data sets of close to 500 simulations, so 400, I think, right now going towards 500. Um, maybe we don't need to get into the details of how we generated them as with an existing large eddy simulation code. We used those data to calibrate first only a few parameters in this model, so nine scalar numbers. It's a very physical based model that has a few parameters that are free and it's just nine essential parameters. And for what I'm showing you, we only tweak these nine parameters um, in one unified physical closure and then simulated various types of cloud regimes. For example, a stable boundary layer of Greenland. There was a field campaign called Gables there at some point in the past. And these solid lines here are large eddy simulations for conditions of this field campaign for winds in this case. The shading is the range of large eddy simulations. So this is hard to simulate numerically, even with uh, simulations of meter scale resolution, millions of degrees of freedom. And the various dashed and dashed dotted lines are our one dimensional model at various resolution ranging from 50 to three meters in the vertical, but it's just a 1D model. So this is the dashed lines have order 100 degrees of freedom, the solid lines 2 million. And it, it, if the, the resolution is sufficient near the surface, the, the one dimensional model captures the, the large eddy simulations extremely well. That's true in the stable boundary layer, which is notoriously hard to simulate. It's true in the stratic cumulus top boundary layer. Here's liquid water. Solid is a large eddy simulation. Gray is a range of other large eddy simulations. They vary a lot in terms of cloud fraction I simulate because even numerical errors in these high resolution simulations have a large impact on the results. Orange are uh, aircraft observations of uh, during the DICOMS field campaign. And blue is again our one dimensional model, the same model as in the upper upper um, plot here. And it captures the stratocumulus boundary layer very well. And again, the number of degrees of freedom in the blue line is uh, order 100 versus 2 million or so for the solid lines. We can look at other places, um, shallow convection in the Caribbean, for example, a classic field campaign. Uh, called uh, BOMEX from 1969, or clouds of the Amazon, perhaps a bit more interesting. So these are deep convective clouds. And the lower the lower, lower two panels show vertical velocity in the upper panel in a large eddy simulation, lower panel in our 1D model. And crucially, it's the same physical 1D model for everything here. And it's, uh, Importantly, our 1D model captures the smooth onset of deep convection and the timing of the onset of deep convection extremely well. This is one notorious area where um, models so far have had a hard time reproducing observations. You can animate results like that. So here is um, the transition from shallow to deep convection. It'll loop through a few times. What you see is there's convection starting when we start on the right panel it's a vertical velocity um, you see turbulence developing in the boundary layer at first um, a cloud growing at some point when this turbulence gets deep enough i'll cycle through in just a second and the cloud first has liquid water in the, in the magenta and later on higher up forming ice and then it starts to precipitate so here's some turbulence a cloud forming a warm cloud liquid cloud um, there is, it's hitting the freezing level at some point here, 
ice forming, precipitation forming, and you see a very gradual smooth transition, a very physical transition from shallow to deep convection that no other parenterization has been able to capture in this way. In typical climate models, you have discontinuous switches from shallow to deep convection, for example, you wouldn't be able to capture a smooth transition and as a result, a diurnal cycle of deep convection as well. So this was primarily a success of physics and reductionist science with a little bit of learning from data, but the learning from data isn't a crucial piece in what I showed you here. The reason this works so well is mostly because of the physical structure of these parentizations. What we want to do is scale this up to an entire Earth system model that learns from data and data that now are not just computationally generated data as we used and what I showed you so far, but are also observational data. In order to do so, you need algorithms for learning from data that are different from what has been commonly used. So what we're doing is we're pursuing the same approach for all components of a new, new Earth system model. If you're working on the atmosphere model at Caltech, the land model together with JPL, and starting to collaborate, for example, with people at the Max Planck Institute in Jena. Um, the MIT group is developing an ocean model, a sea ice model. And we are beginning to couple the components. Once we have coupled them, the idea is that all components jointly will learn from data, be those observations from space or the ground, or computationally generated data through a data simulation machine learning there that will be common to all those model components. Right now, all we have done is do this for pieces of model components. The goal is to do this jointly. Now, here's an important point on how we approach this problem. When people have used machine learning tools to overcome the widely acknowledged parentization challenges. The way they tended to do that is through supervised learning, through presenting a model with detailed data, usually just generated computationally because the detail of data needed here is not available from observations, for example, tendencies of moisture or temperature, and learn relations between, say, tendencies of moisture moisture and temperature and the large scale state as a machine learning, rep machine learning representation of convection schemes and the like. That approach is hard to generalize and that's a well-known issue. The models trained that way do not easily generalize say to warmer climates than what they were trained on. It's hard to interpret because you have this black box of schemes that, that fold together many different physical processes into one big emulator. It's really challenging to do uncertainty quantification on it. In fact, as no one quite knows how to do that yet. And perhaps thirdly, it's really, or the final point is, it, it really is not possible to use observational data with this approach. There are resolution mismatch issues. And there are issues that the data required for that approach simply are not available. Uh, the minute or hour scale tendencies and the temperature of moisture. Instead, we take a different approach that is more of an inverse problem than a supervised learning approach. So we're building a model that learns from time averaged climate statistics. You aggregate climate statistics, cloud cover and the like in time. And what you achieve in doing so is, well, first you focus directly on what matters for climate prediction or system prediction, which are statistics. Second, you increase the smoothness of the statistics um, which makes the inverse problems somewhat more tractable or friendly. Now, averaging loses information always. You do lose some information. And there, there arises a question how you average not to lose too much information and gain smoothness. But one thing you gain is you can include any statistic you want in this approach. This could be precipitation extremes. It's not confined to mean values or even covariances. You can, you can include covariances like temperature, cloud cover covariances, which are emergent constraints on climate. You can directly incorporate them in the loss function. It's very attractive to do that because it directly takes on board what we know, say, about emergent constraints. It, it removes the problems of observation simulation resolution mismatch because once we average the statistics very pretty smoothly in space. So cloud cover is a smoothly varying statistic. The, the cloud cover at any instant is not. 
but there's no free lunch. And the problem here is that the evaluation of the loss function involves accumulation of averages, and that is extremely expensive. So you need to run a climate model for seasons, perhaps years, to accumulate these averages. And that makes it very expensive because with traditional learning methods, you would now need 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 runs of the climate model each season's two years long, and that's simply not possible or not possible at the resolution you want to use. So here is a way we found to make this problem tractable, and it involves a marriage of tools from inverse problems, from essentially weather forecasting, common inversion and variance, and machine learning tools. The upshot of all of that is it gives us a way to accelerate Bayesian learning by roughly a factor 1000, making this all tractable within a climate model. And here's how it goes. So a climate model is a map, G, from parameters data or parametric functions, or even non-parametric functions, to climate statistics, Y. And the problem we have is learning about the parameters data from the given climate statistics y, and they are functionally related through an equation that looks like that, where the data, keep in mind their time averages, are the mapping g of theta plus some noise, and the noise is reasonably assumed to be Gaussian because central limit theorem arguments apply if you're looking at statistics. It's reasonably assumed to be Gaussian. Well, we also wanted to have zero mean. That requires an additional assumption. It requires that our model is unbiased. Now that's a big leap. Um, we need to make the model unbiased. So th theta needs to include models for structural model error. I won't have time to talk about how to do this now, but they have to be included here to get unbiased models in the end. Otherwise, of course, climate models will have biases. And then we use an algorithm called calibrate emulate sample um, that solves this inverse problem very efficiently. It builds some proven and scalable algorithms. And what it does is consists of three steps, the calibration step, emulation, and the sampling step. In the calibration step, we are using variants of common inversion, essentially to generate pairs of training points, theta and y, in a potentially high dimensional parameter space, theta, and what common inversion does is place these pairs of training points in a judicious way so that they cluster around the maximum of the posterior density that we are interested in here. So common inversion algorithms are very efficient optimization algorithms for solving this problem. What they're not good at is providing uncertainty quantification. Basically, the ensembles easily collapse in traditional ensemble common inversion providing no usable information about uncertainties. However, the algorithms converge in practice relatively quickly. Typically, you need ensembles of size 100 or so, maybe with five iterations. So you end up with 500 pairs of parameters and data, and they are placed in a judicious way in this space of parameters so that they cluster around the region of interest near the maximum of the posterior distribution. So on these, say, 500 pairs of points, we train an emulator of this mapping from theta to y. And this emulator can be consisting of neural networks. I'll show you an example with Gaussian processes. We now have done this with random feature models, uh, with, with neural operators. All sorts of options are possible for generating this emulator. This emulator doesn't need to be interpretable. It just needs to fit. It just needs to interpolate. And crucially, this emulator is easy and fast to evaluate. So we can then use standard algorithms for Bayesian learning, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms, to sample this emulator. We can sample it a million times at virtually no marginal computational cost. All the computational cost is in this calibration step because the climate model evaluation is expensive. Emulation sampling is fast and easy. And the efficiency of the algorithm comes from the fact that the calibration step requires only around 500 to maybe a thousand evaluations of a climate model. Once we have done that, emulation is cheap, sampling is cheap, and we can sample a million times at that point and don't have to sample the original model G a million times. There are additional advantages. The emulator is smoothest. Um, 
the, the mapping G as well. So this noise term here coming from sampling variability is smoothed out through the emulation, which has additional advantages for MCMC and makes that more effective. So what we can show is that the algorithm as a whole gives us, gives us approximate Bayesian learning and roughly one thousandth of the cost of traditional Bayesian learning. And let me just show you a simple proof of concept with a two parameter, very simple climate model. So it's a climate model that uh, we have used in my group for a number of decades for studies of atmospheric dynamics. It says only a water surface. It has a relatively simple convection scheme that relaxes temperatures T towards reference profiles, which are moist adiabatic or sometimes scaled tau. And it relaxes moisture Q likewise towards reference profiles that are characterized by a fixed reference specific humidity, also relaxed on some the same time scale tau. In reality, it's a slightly more complicated than that, but that captures the essence here that there are two parameters that are unknown. It's this reference relative humidity and the uh, time scale tau. Now, we generate data in a perfect model setting. We actually know what we set these parameters to. And I just want to demonstrate that we can use this calibrate emulate sample algorithm to effectively and efficiently learn about those parameters. So in the calibration step, here are it's an ensemble of size 100 in this two-dimensional parameter space consisting of the time scale tau, the relative humidity um, RH. The two parameters we know, it's just a perfect model setting. So this is unbiased by construction, makes this problem a good bit easier than it would be in the real world. The true parameters are at 70% in two hours. And there's an ensemble of size 100 points um, in this two-dimensional parameter space. And ensemble common inversion converges quickly within about five iterations. It converges in the vicinity of the true parameter values. So it's a good optimizer. And more to the point for us is, and this is just a 2D parameter space for illustration, the way to think of common inversion here is that it solves the optimum desi optimal design problem of placing points in a potentially high dimensional parameter space in such a way as to effectively sample near the, um, near the maximum a posteriori. I did not say, but should have said what our loss function was in this case. Our loss function in this case contained the relative humidity in the mid troposphere as a function of latitude in this zonally statistically symmetric model contained the mean precipitation rate as a function of latitude and in end it contained a measure of intense precipitation meaning precipitation exceeding the 90th percentile precipitation in a control simulation so in that control simulation at the true parameter that 90th percentile should be exceeded 10 percent of the time so this is the loss function here with the uh, whiskers, sparse and whiskers indicating the sampling variability in a climate model. And the orange shading is our emulator of this mapping from parameters to climate statistics, which in this case is a Gaussian process emulator. And what the plots show is that the emulator does extremely well in capturing the variability and the mean of uh, the terms in this loss function. So it's a good emulator. The downside of Gaussian processes, for those who know about machine learning tools, is they don't scale very well to high dimensional spaces. So we have done such things with neural networks, which scale better with random feature models and various other choices of emulator possible. Now we can sample from this emulator. And we can sample very effectively because evaluating the emulator is very cheap. So here is Markov chain Monte Carlo's 500 iterations. This takes minutes to do on this Gaussian process. And what we get as a result of that is a posterior density and color here in this two-dimensional space of time scale and relative humidity. And you see the posterior density has a maximum near the two parameters, 70% two hours. For comparison, here's the common ensemble, all the 100 points at the end of the common iteration. You see they cluster much more than the posterior density, well-known issue that the ensemble collapses and um, because it collapses, does not provide a useful estimate of uncertainty anymore. The actual density, as shown here, is a useful estimate of uncertainty. So this gives us Bayesian learning at one, one thousandth of the cost of standard methods. We can show that the PDF here, in fact, gives a good estimate of uncertainty by brute force um, 
sampling the climate model. In this case, the model is easy enough, we can do it. And we, we, we know that this gives us a good estimate of the posterior density as a result of that. Now, in the end, you want to get climate predictions with quantified uncertainties out of all of that. And the way you can do it is now you have, say, at the, at the result, as a result of the MCMC, if you have 500,000 um, samples of um, central parameters for a climate model from the posterior density, then we can just draw from that posterior density, say, an ensemble of size 100 run it forward in time by changing boundary conditions, say increasing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. That's what we did in this example here. So here we're looking now at the probability of exceeding the 99.9 percentile of control precipitation. So this should be um, exceeded 0.1 percent of the time in the control precipitation. And then we warm the climate by increasing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And what happens is that what in the control climate is a 0.1% um, event becomes a much more frequent event in the warmer climate. Extremes become more frequent in ways that we have heard uh, many times. Quite extremely so in mid-latitudes, high latitudes. This is what used to be a 0.1% event reaches in the 1, 2, 3% um, in frequency. And even more importantly, we have an ensemble that we run forward that allows us to quantify the uncertainty. On, on this climate prediction in this prototype setting. And that's the orange shading. And what you see is that the uncertainty is modest in the extra tropics. It's very large in the tropics, which is consistent with what we know of precipitation extremes from much more comprehensive climate models. And that um, the convection scheme is very uncertain. It dominates in the tropics. And as a result, it's quite hard to say how precipitation extremes change in the tropics. Thermodynamic control is much more predominant in the extra tropics. And as a result, uncertainties are much smaller. There is a lot more one can do with these types of algorithm. All of this was by construction evolving models that were unbiased with perfect data. You won't have that in reality, of course. So we have shown how you can incorporate sparse learning about structural model errors in the same framework to achieve, in the end, an unbiased model with, um, with structural error models that you can take apart. It's an interesting topic. I'd be happy to talk more with people about perhaps later. Um, won't have time to go into here right now. As I said, we're presuming the same approach for all components of this all new Earth system model. Um, for example, I mean, in the ocean, it's in some ways, as the quip goes, just like an atmosphere, except it's dry, meaning there's no latent heat release. Perhaps unsurprising that similar approaches work just as well. The land biosphere is slightly more surprising, at least it was to me that by using mechanistic models of uh, plant hydraulics, photosynthesis, together with modern data, solar-induced fluorescence, for example, um, we can be similarly successful with relatively simple land biosphere model that yet fit, fit existing data quite well. What we want to achieve by next year or so, have a first full model that learns automatically from observations and high-resolution simulations. Again, we have done this with model pieces, but we haven't done that yet for a full integrated model that's work in progress. We want to achieve improved simulations of the present climate, for example, the rainfall distribution, local rainfall extremes, and the like. And well, ultimately, we would like to predict, predict, provide predictions with uncertainty quantification, including of structural model errors based on observations and these high resolution simulations. So to, to summarize a few key points, I think reducing and, and quantifying uncertainties in climate models is urgent. No one probably seriously disputes that. But I think it's also within reach, um, within reach within a few years and without building massive supercomputing facilities dedicated for climate modeling, for example. And in order to achieve this goal, I think the way forward is to combine process informed models with data driven approaches that harness climate statistics. Focusing on climate statistics, I think, is the key to success and makes what we do here different from what, what other approaches that are being pursued. It has been a 
an extremely pleasant surprise uh, to me at least, and I think to everyone else involved in the project, is how successful sparsely parameterized physics-based subgrid scale models can be in capturing turbulence and cloud regimes that have vexed climate models for decades. We have one unified model that works for all climate regimes that we have tried so far. And it has been very pleasing to see that it still works out of the sample to which we first tuned this and the like. And the models are built from the outset to learn both from observations and where possible from high resolution simulations that we have conducted offline so far. Eventually, it would be nice to spin them off on the fly where you need them, when you need them. And this Calibrate Emulate sample algorithm is a workhorse for our learning from data. It, um, it achieves about a factor thousand speed up relative to traditional Bayesian learning methods, making this approach I outlined feasible with climate models in the first place. It would not be feasible with state-of-the-art algorithms before this. A lot of work remains to be done from advancing theory to building uh, codes that scale better on modern HPC architectures to solving the questions of how to target right resolution simulations so they're maximally informative and the like and the like. Ours is very much an open project. We welcome collaboration. We uh, are excited for everyone who joins in because what we want is to built a better communicate climate model for everyone. And I think it, the more people contribute, the more successful it will be. A thank to our funders, Eric and Wendy Schmidt are our main funders through Schmidt Futures. And there's a number of other foundations, Rising Simons Foundation has provided funding, National Science Foundation, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency now as well, and something called the Ron and Maxine Lind Climate Challenge. We'll leave it at that and happy to answer questions. Thanks, Tapio. That was fascinating. I wish we had 45 minutes to ask you questions, but um, we've only got about five minutes. Um, please place your questions in the chat if you have questions. Um, I'll start off um, with the emulators. You're talking about these, these emulators that rapidly produced uh, climate projections. Could you explain those a little bit more? Are they very reduced order models? Like how many variables do the emulators have? Are they like focused on specific specific climate statistics? Like you showed rainfall results, yeah. a model that was mainly aimed at rainfall or it, it yeah. graphic distribution or it just gives a, a, a global average? What, yeah. Uh, the, the emulators are, actually what you see here. I mean, they're really only a mapping from the parameters in the model to whatever the terms are in your loss function. So they're, they're not trying to emulate everything day to day, whether it's like, it's just emulating the quantities that we decided to be of interest. For this model, it happens to be these three statistics for the- So these were like longitudinal averages of, of rainfall in this is this in this case, there were in the, I didn't yeah. show you that for the cloud models, what we use there is vertical profiles of conserved variables, vertical profile of liquid water, ice in the clouds, uh, precipitation rates and the like. But in each case, it's just the statistics of interest. So it's a very limited ask to, to the emulators. We're not asking them to emulate everything a climate model does, only emulate the statistics we care about. Great. Um, Still no questions in the chat, so I'm going to keep going. It, Nathan, tell me if I'm looking at the wrong page. I'm just looking at the chat. Is there another spot I should be looking at for questions? Yeah, okay, questions in the chat. That's what Nathan just said. Okay, um, yeah, so another one is with this uh, the simple GCM experiment you did. Was I understanding that correctly and that you basically... Uh, the climate that you trained on, there are, there are just, what did you have? You had these two parameters that were, you took as being uncertain. Um, is that right? You just had one true parameter and, yeah. and um, yeah. okay. So in that framework, I'm just trying to understand that from a Bayesian point of view. Normally the idea with a Bayesian approach is you would have a prior distribution of parameters, yeah? So these are all the possible values that you can't possibly know. And then you'd have observations, mm -hmm. statistics, associated yeah. with all of those. And they would be normally, you know, like in data assimilation, we have these big observational errors. So you end up with this situation for the same observations, 
there's lots of different truths, like for the same observed values, you'll have a, a range of different truths. And that's the posterior. That's the uncertainty we need to capture. And so I couldn't quite see how you showed that, oh, look, with the emulator, we've got uncertainty. I'm like, I don't know, there was no uncertainty in the prior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I skipped through a lot of details. So the pri <clears throat> and the prior as an example I showed you were <clears throat> uninformative. They were spanning the space of that, that you see there very wide. In reality, I mean, these are ill-post problems as always. <clears throat> you need to regularize them by providing some prior information. The way we are doing this in practice is that the prior information, well, A comes from the simply our physics development that we have some understanding of what reasonable parameters are. And then B, from these computational experiments with large eddy simulations, we, we have some way of giving a prior to, to the parameters before, say, learning them from observational data. <clears throat> Even if you do all of that, of course, it's quite possible that there is what people call the equifinality. I mean, that the parameters may not be uniquely defined. There may, the, the posterior might have ridges and valleys and the like, but that comes out of the analysis. I mean, that's a nice thing here. And that's one of the attractive feature of doing joint calibration on, on an older system model, because you will see the correlations among parameters that perhaps you didn't expect. Perhaps there are correlations between stomatal resistance and boundary layer turbulence parameters, and you would see it and you would see how they're related. Then you can go back and, um, well, that's where the human needs to be in a loop, I believe. You can go back and ask, well, this correlation is maybe not what I like to have there. I like to have decorrelated parameters as much as possible. Let's see how we can redesign the model. I think there was a question in the chat I just saw going by is, yeah. could you, could you uh, also automate the choice of parameters? That's actually an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> I mean, right now we simply learn all parameters that we consider in some fashion uncertain. So um, I think what you could do is, is, is batching approaches, mini batching approaches in machine learning that, that you go through batches and sequentially update parameters and that the ones that become more secure, perhaps you drop from a batch and update what, what remains. So I think in that, that sense, you can, um, recurse on parameters through batching approaches. That might that, that, that would be one option. We have used many batching approaches, not with eliminating parameters entirely, but you do see uh, you know, gradual tightening of some parameters versus others. Um, I think there was one other question. Oh, that was the parameters, right? So another pet question I missed here. Nathan, can we grant, did Navid want to just ask a question directly? Can we do that? Yeah, they, they can talk if they'd like. I think we, we got it. That was the question I asked. Thanks, Tapia. Yeah, thank you. I think there's a lot more to be done in that direction. I mean, the you can, Navid, maybe you were thinking about these history matching approaches, right, that are essentially first trying to narrow down the region of parameter space that's at all plausible and then search more within that region. Um, those types of approaches don't scale very well to high dimensions. It's just really hard to explore a high dimensional space uh, and, and look for feasible regions in it. The nice thing about these common inversion algorithms is that in some ways they act like an optimal design algorithm that they place these parameter output pairs in regions that are interesting and most interesting even in high dimensional spaces. So my general take is because they scale so well and they do so well at solving that optimal design problem. The hope is, we haven't done that, but the hope is that you can just use all parameters. Yeah. So Nathan, we need to move on, don't we? Unfortunately, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you can close it off if you want, Craig. Yeah, so let's um, give a big thank you to Tapio for his uh, very interesting and, and visionary uh, talk. Thanks so much.